And in about three seconds, yeah, there we go. We are live. And let me just quickly look at the comments over here. Uh, tuk, tuk, tuk. This seems to be set up correctly. Cell phone is buzzing quite a lot. Uh, cool. Okay, let me end this other time. Okay, no, never mind. People are still chatting over there. Uh, yeah, YouTube says we are live as well. Um, yeah, we don't have any viewers at the moment, so this is very awkward. It feels like a private party and nobody pitched up. Just like work. <laughs> ah, at the moment, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun. Yeah, so we can literally just uh, have some fun now. This is being a uh, uh i think well not think i know this is being recorded to youtube as well so we can might as well make it some fun for ourselves while we wait for our huge audience to pitch up it would be very amusing if nobody comes <laughs> that'd be interesting that sometimes uh, it sometimes happens because this one at the moment we're busy trying to grow organically so the idea is to set it up with this recurring schedule and get people into the habit of just joining um, knowing that we'll be here to answer the question. So we aren't putting too much promotion behind it because we want to see um, is there interest for it or not. And also I think if it grows to be too large, then it becomes hard to handle the questions again. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, we had a little blip over there. Um, I saw the videos freeze. Yours okay, we have got some people. Mm -hmm. Let me just double check here. It seems we are having a little bit of internet fun. Okay, now I can see that we are back. Okay, cool. So we actually have some viewers now. So welcome to those who've joined us. Um, we are going to be taking technical questions today. But before we get to that part, uh, I think we shall do some introductions. So I will let uh, the lady present today go first. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Isabel Huerga. And I am a developer advocate at AWS. Uh, I joined the team very recently, actually. Uh, before joining this team, I was actually a technical account manager at TAM. <laughs> I don't know if everybody is familiar with um, what a TAM is. Um, just in case, I'm going to just publicize TAMs. Uh, they are part of the support organization, and they work with uh, customers that have an enterprise support agreement. And yeah, you might have also noticed my accent. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the UK team, but I'm originally from Spain, but have been living 10 years in Italy, so it's all messed up. <laughs> no, it's all and good. That's me. Very European. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, Dennis. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's my first office hours. <laughs> that has been, I've, I've actually just joined the team of developer advocates at AWS um, two and a half weeks ago. So I'm the new face on the team. Um, I used to be a solutions architect at AWS before that. So I was supporting a customer with more of a strategic, a strategic technical questions. And um, But I always loved working with developers. I always loved writing code. And in my previous role, I did a lot of a lot of strategy talk and meetings. And uh, as a developer advocate, I'm getting back to writing code. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm going to help you. I'm based out of um, Dach, the Dach region, Germany, uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland is the region that I'm taking care of. I am based in beautiful, rainy Hamburg, Northern Germany. And yeah, as I said, I'm happy to be here. Follow me on Twitter at dtraub. Uh, can be written somewhere down there. Yeah, you can see that. <laughs> you can go like, oh, subscribe. Yeah. Yes, we're now online. I, I still find that very weird when I do YouTube videos. It's like, or. Yeah, it's right. Or can we take five? Like I don't know if we are in the same, <laughs> as I said, yeah. can we have five? Like, yeah, well, and I'm always. I, I don't know. It's, where are you? <laughs> this side. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, this one. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, yes. I'm always pointing at the screen when I'm pointing at something, but that's much better. Probably. Yeah, yes. Your... <laughs> cool. Yeah. So just quickly running off, I'm Kubis Bernard. I have been on the team now for a year and a half. It just feels like one month, but it also feels like seven years. Um, and before that, I was actually an AWS customer for eight years. So I've also been building on AWS for a decent amount. Um, and yeah, having a lot of fun. So 
for those that are live, uh, please um, throw any questions that you have in the chat, and then we'll pop that on the screen, and then we'll discuss that question and see if we can help you with any technical questions. Um, and if we don't get any technical questions, we'll just sit here and uh, share dad jokes and um, be silly, <laughs> basically. So, yeah, um, we don't have any questions yet, so I'm going to wait for that. So do any of you two have something interesting that you dealt with this week from a technical question perspective or request that came in? Well, um, we made RDS proxy generally available, which to me is like super interesting. Um, and I had a couple of questions. Um, one was if it works with Lambda and it's perfect use case. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and there is a blog uh, about it actually uh, that was written a while ago and it has been updated. So super easy to use. Cool. Uh, Dennis, you have anything? Uh, well, uh, I didn't have any 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 real questions in the last days, but what I think is really interesting, and what I really would like to know what the audience thinks about is, is our announcement of honey code, so a basically no code mm. or rather low yeah. code um, tool uh, to help you build quickly build applications. Oh, there actually is a, a question in the chat right now. Okay. Mm. Cool, I'll put it on the screen. Um, I'm more than happy to take this one because it keeps coming up all the time. Um, so basically, we are trying to roll out as many of the services as we can. Um, but typically, how it works is that when we roll out a service globally, um, it, we start off with a starting point region. And then um, not, uh, there are some services that go to multiple regions on the same day at the initial launch. And then the others are it's rolling rollout because it's a way to mitigate risk and make sure that we keep an eye on performance uh, and make sure that the deployments um, don't go bad. And in just in general, in terms of features, when we launch a new region, you can imagine the amount of different services we have. There's a lot of interdependencies. So we don't try and launch everything at once on the first day because that'll just take, make it take too long. Um, so we launch with a batch of services on day one. But even on that first day, you'll see deployments happening like an hour after we open up the region. So we continuously are deploying the services there. Um, and we don't um, share this timeline with our customers because we find that creates an expectation. Um, and as you know, with software, sometimes those timelines slip. And we just find it's a better experience rather not to say, oh, we th uh, it's going to come out on this date and then we miss that date. And rather just take a look at some other regions to get an idea of when and what is available out there. So always go to that region. So you can just search for AWS regions uh, service table and you'll get a list of all the different services across all the different regions. Because also, for example, some services like uh, SES, which is an emailing service, um, doesn't roll out to every single region because you can connect to, uh, like, for example, Ireland from all the EU regions, um, et cetera. Yeah, okay. I also usually recommend uh, following the what's new. There is an RSS feed, um, so you can also like put keywords um, so you get notified whenever there is something new in that region. Cool. I'm just pasting the link in there quickly. Uh, there we go. That's a nice link. Yeah, nice. Thanks for that link. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, um, so I'm trying to think there was, there's actually been quite a few releases. I haven't had time this week yet to catch up on them. Uh, believe it or not, even for us working at AWS, we keep an eye on the public list um, in terms of when things release because there's um, so many things releasing the whole time. Um, I think that's um, the last official number. Does anybody, any one of you know what our last deployment number is that we shared? Um, I think it was 150 million deploys a year. I remember it's in that scope. It's something like every six seconds we push out a deploy uh, between AWS and Amazon.com. Um, so we have got a question. Let's pop it up here quickly, uh, which is, uh, uh, hey, Jared, how are you doing? Um, Setting up a dynamic site using CloudFront, fronting an ELB, the site works well, couldn't log in initially, but then update a distribution to forward on whitelisted cookies. All resources are getting a miss, though. Seems the requests are going through to origin. Any ideas? Um, this one is probably when you set up um, the request forwarding in CloudFront, I believe you need to configure it uh, to only forward certain requests, not all requests. Um, that is uh, my... I played with this a while ago, so it's been a while. Has any of you two maybe played with CloudFront more recently? I think uh, I hope I'm not confusing anything right now. You can set up different behaviors for CloudFront, so that's various types of requests um, are being um, propagated through to the origin, and it could be that there is still some configuration that needs to be done. 
Mm. But uh, what I'll do, Jared, is I'll put this on my list over here. Let me just quickly open it up, and I will go see if I can find a definitive answer for you, and then ping you with it. Luckily, I know who you are and where you mm. live. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Uh, no other questions? Yeah, I'll take that one off again. Um, so fun one for me while we're waiting for the next question is um, I actually spent a lot more time with Elastic Beanstalk um, in the last two to three weeks with some of the demos on containers that I did. And it's one of those weird services that as AWS customer, I used to think it's not something worth looking at because um, I've never really heard about it, even though it's one of our oldest services. And I was actually very, very impressed with it. It's, um, it's super easy to use and um, the ability to just quickly change from a single instance using an Elastic IP to load balancer with multiple instances and you set up your scaling. It's, I think, about three clicks in one field that you change. Um, and it just works. So my next step now is I'm going to build out a demo just to show how to hook it up to um, a custom domain and then use Certificate Manager. Um, but really, really surprised about how easy it is because I've spoken about it, but never built something properly. And this is like, nice. Yeah, that's cool. It's also very useful to um, to learn, I think, I find, because it creates everything for you, but you can still then go and see and have control and make changes. So I think it's a great way to introduce yourself if you don't have a lot of experience. Um, so it does it for you, but so it does it okay, it does it well, and then you can go and <laughs> touch and break it, <laughs> basically. Yeah, it's, mm. a, it's, a, it's a great learning tool, but it's also a great uh, tool really to deploy simple workloads um, yeah. to get up and running uh, pretty quickly. It is as uh, certainly uh, we can go to, uh, get to that question maybe first. I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the question is in working with AWS Edge devices, especially the Jetson series device, how do I create more than one model at the cloud and deploy to Edge, connect with NVIDIA, DeepStream, and so on, need an in-depth workflow? So. This one is a fairly advanced question, I believe, from the uh, machine learning side as well as with the IoT side. Um, now, I do know that we've got SageMaker Neo that actually is um, builds out optimized machine learning models specifically to, to deploy to a subset of devices. Uh, I know we've got some Intel devices on that list. Um, I want to say Raspberry Pi as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you give me a second, I'll pull up the list. And I'm, I'm not sure if that uh, Jetson series device is in that list at the moment. Uh, the reason is that SageMaker Neo actually optimizes the model specifically for these low power devices um, and then also manages the deployment onto the edge device for you, which is quite useful. Uh, so give me one second. I'm just curious in the meantime who, who, who has support, who, because I, I always, like to stress that our support teams is not only there for when things break, they are also like willing to answer any questions. How do I do this? Or what is the documentation for that? Or is this supported? Like they can answer any questions. They are not only there for break fix or for, for things that are not working. They are willing to help with anything. So, Yes, uh, that's a very good point. It's one of those, I've actually um, I spoke to someone who had a customer in, I can't remember, somewhere else, somewhere, I want to say Europe, the country, um, <laughs> where they built out an entire application without not knowing how to code. They literally went with support, hey, I want to do this. So support responded with, I'm not sure about um, if you should do it, but I think you should do it in these three different parts. And then they took each one of those, turned it into support question, and then just uh, fanned out like this with a whole bunch of support questions, I actually built an entire app with help from support without knowing how to code, which was very impressive. So yeah, uh, quickly getting back to that question. So SageMaker Neo supports devices from or hardware from Intel, NVIDIA, and ARM. Um, I'm not familiar with the Jetson series, if that is a NVIDIA device or not. Uh, if it is, I can definitely, um, it'll, you'll, you should look into SageMaker Neo. Uh, if it's not, then what you can look at is using um, AWS Greengrass to actually deploy your containers onto your IoT devices because it'll help you distribute. And then you can use um, different tooling on AWS to actually build up that container that you want to deploy. That is a fairly advanced um, workflow, though. My best advice there is to follow uh, Julian Simon, who's our global um, uh, uh, AI and machine learning expert. Uh, if you give me a... Second, I just need to grab his Twitter handle for you. 
and do that, yeah, there I it do is. That, I, I just tried to post the link on, on Twitter. Uh, I realized I can't do that. So I, I sent you a link, Kobus. Maybe you can post that on, uh, on Twitch, not on Twitter, on Twitch. Okay, cool. Um, blog post that might be interesting in this regard. I don't know if it answers the question specifically, but um, it goes in the direction, I think. OK, cool. That's a poll. Uh, ML, cool. And I will copy that quickly. Uh, OK, can you send me the link quickly on Chime? Uh, Did you no, read? I I can't because I have, don't have. No, no, on on. It's uh, I oh, it. okay. Oh, is it in private chat? Okay, this is sorry. This yeah. is a new inter interface that we are playing with as a team, uh, and I got it. Uh, let's see how this pays. And I think it went out. Okay, cool. All righty. Uh, link is there as well. Ah, oh, it cut. Oh, this is annoying. The YouTube comment has got a. <laughs> Limit, so it's chopped it up. Okay, uh, cool. New question on EKS. Um, uh, okay, cool. So the question here is that during my EKS webinar, I use an ingress service for the load balancer. Why not use a service type load balancer? Um, if I remember correctly, is that I must go look at the demo. Sorry, it's been three or four other demos, and I did some other things with Kubernetes in between. Um, but I get what you're saying is instead of using ingress service, uh, make use of the specific load balancer service. I want to say I initially looked at, and that would spin up an elastic load balancer, which is the first generation of a load balancer, not an application load balancer, uh, because we did launch with that initially. But what I'll do is I'll add this to my list of questions to double check, and I will post a response on Twitter for you. Uh, Uh, okay, there we go. I have got a note for that one now as well. Cool. Sorry, these are two screens away. Okay, cool. Um, any more questions? Um, otherwise, I think, Dennis, you were about to tell us something interesting about uh, Elastic Beanstalk. Oh, well, I don't know if it's very interesting. It's just... <laughs> Um, I found I found Elastic Beanstalk to be a really great tool for, for, on one side, really to learn how the services play together because it it plugs everything together so that it works. It can be sometimes, especially when you start an AWS, it can be uh, tedious to uh, to set up a network with all the with all the security groups and network ACLs and the Internet Gateway routing tables and so forth because essentially the infrastructure services that we have in AWS, the networking services, are similar to what you have in a real physical network. Uh, so you have to plug everything together. And certainly when I started out, sometimes things didn't work. I wasn't able to reach a server or something didn't really work as, as I thought because I missed something important. And uh, that was for me something where I really learned how a proper network configuration looks like by setting up a, an Elastic Beanstalk environment, deploying an application, and just looking at all the resources that it's deployed and looking at how they play together. And um, this is what would help me. But at the same time, yeah. it is really great to actually run applications. It's it's not just a learning tool. It is a full-blown configuration management that you can use. It's pretty opinionated, of course, because yeah. it, it does a lot of the work uh, that you don't have to do then. Um, but uh, once you start uh, going into your own custom, more complicated uh, infrastructures, you would even uh, like to look at um, Opsworks as a service, which is more mm. uh, not so opinionated, but you do have to do a little more. Mm. That's interesting. No, that, it's... Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, Dennis, because I come from a uh, sysadmin background um, and operations. so. To me, all that language was super straightforward, and it helped me translate all these concepts and all this knowledge that I had into AWS specific. Mm -hmm. So maybe yeah. that's why, for me, it was more straightforward and, oh, brilliant. Yeah, and for me, yeah. I, was, I used to be a developer my whole career, and I did not do so much networking. Right. So, um, Using the cloud, uh, using the cloud on one side, it's really great because you can do everything yourself. But at the same time, there are some things that 
you just need to learn that you just need to get used to. And this is where something like Elastic Beanstalk as a managed service is really great because it helps you set up everything as, as it's supposed to be and you can really focus on your application and get it out there as quick as quickly as possible. Mm. No, it's, the, it's something I've seen commonly with developers that often they aren't interested in the networking and, and DNS, for example, how it works because they feel that their job is there to write the application code and get it out and running. Um, but as soon as you've got any kind of in, um, like ex operational experience of running your app, uh, you always need to dig into how how's the networking working, what's the DNS setup, is it resolving? Because there's always DNS, we know that. Um, even if you think it's, <laughs> it's not. It's never the DNS. <laughs> Yeah, so it's one of those interesting things that I find like, especially in the cloud, you need to understand the networking and spend some time knowing how things connect and communicate. Um, and it's helpful at the same time because you can, if something doesn't work, you can fix it yourself. And yeah. you don't have to call the ops team and write a ticket and hope that somebody's going to work at it at some point in time because they are always overworked, just like we are. Um, and that's uh, the great thing with the cloud. You can really take care of many things yourselves. And uh, actually, we as AWS, we take care of a lot of the things that um, in traditional environments, people have to do themselves. So it's a mm. great mix of having, having to do, but also being able to learn a little more beyond just the simple, well, it's not simple, <laughs> but beyond <laughs> just building, building an application. <laughs> mm. Now, the fun part there is if you start bringing infrastructure as code into your pipeline of how you define it, you can pretty much define almost everything in AWS with that is you can log a ticket to your, if you still have the infrastructure team saying, listen, this is broken, it's not working, can you please, this is what I think is a fix, um, and then give them a solution and then they can approve it and roll it out. Uh, and even if you, don't, if you want to go one step further, uh, separate all the environments so that you've got full control over even your own networking stacks. If you find a problem, go fix it. It's, yeah. Cool. Sorry, I'm quickly going to have a look at our Twitter and LinkedIn questions. If one of you want to, I think, continue or add something. Yeah, no, it's um, the other thing that I find that it kind of drives you to look at that maybe you weren't exposed to before. Um, I, mean, I mean, when you move to the cloud is security. Um, in addition to the networking, it's kind of you have to be aware of how security works and you have to be to take more responsibility of what you might have been used in in more traditional environments or on premises or non cloud sorry i missed mm. the last bit of that um yeah no i think we have a also a comment um oh, okay cool. let me pop that. up quickly yeah. sorry we don't have any questions on twitter or linkedin yet just a lot of reshares so, yeah, so I've seen people sourcing for DevOps and they insist that you have a dev background of 10 years coding Java and they don't bother with network or system skills and I never understand this. Uh, should be more of features, yeah. Now, I've seen this as well. I mean, I what, had what was typically now known as a DevOps role probably for about four or five years before joining AWS, um, which ends up being a lot of automation, cloud configuration, cloud service usage, and changing applications to actually use cloud native services instead of, for example, spinning up your own RabbitMQ cluster, or rather use something like Amazon SQS. Um, and part of that that I never understood and why I went that route is that as a developer, I don't understand why you didn't want to know how to set up and deploy your applications. It's literally... Why do you just want to write code? It's like, that's not the fun. It's the getting it out there, getting it working, and seeing it work and understand how it works. Because then when something breaks, that fun of digging down and learning something was like super fun where a lot of people were just like, eh, it's not code, it's not my problem. So. I mean, I mean, there are two, th two sides to it because um, developers and ops people um, are inherently different in their focus and maybe also in how they like to work. Because as a de developer, you want to build new things, you want to get features out there, you want to create a great thing. And the upside of you is very often, it's pretty conservative. We need to keep it running. We need to make sure that we see if everything is running as it's intended, uh, if we have any devi deviations and so forth. We have to keep security in mind and things like that. And um, traditionally, these were, were extremely different roles and they were contradicting, contradicting each other. So the developers were churning out features and the ops people were pushing back because, uh, oh, we need to run this somehow. And at the same time, um, the ops people were slowing development or could have uh, slowed development down. And in a, in a, in a DevOps environment, 
uh, you bring both mindsets together. It's not that now one person does everything and one person has the, the forward-looking um, experimental mindset of a developer, but the conservative security-focused mindset of an ops person at the same time. It's different people in the same team that do have the different mindsets and um, it's all a matter of balance. And again, the cloud, the cloud provides you with the tools to, um, to basically code, to script your infrastructure, your operations, your security. You can, can put all this in code and you can actually build features using the operational or security features that or services that AWS has. So that's uh, mm -hmm. where, where things come together. So I think uh, I'm always having a really hard time when people are talking about a DevOps engineer. I still don't <laughs> really know what that is. Uh, what I do know is that dev DevOps certainly is a thing that uh, has a lot to do with practices and culture and mindset mm -hmm. and all these kinds of things. Um, where you have to bring different people together. You have to have a diverse team with a diverse mindset, with a diverse approach to get things up and running quickly. No, no, I definitely agree with that. I think what's happened is that a lot of, because um, I see it more often being people coming from the sysadmin side uh, into what's called DevOps at the moment, which basically boils down to automation, CI, CD, and making use of the cloud um, all from the non-writing code perspective. Yes. In good. case you're wondering, this is, yeah, sorry. Yes, sorry. No, no, there was a yes, but uh, I want to hear the yes, but I love uh -huh. those. Well, coming from me, I, don't, I have no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> I can't remember. Okay. Well, we can then, uh, throw up our new, next question. We have got one that says, how do I create an API that accepts requests from my web app, JavaScript, and communicates with uh, DynamoDB? So the good news here is go look at AWS Amplify. It is a framework, it's open source uh, as well, that will connect a whole bunch of different AWS services for you and make this super easy to do. Builds up the cloud formation templates for you in the background to actually create your infrastructure. Um, and for example, to do an API uh, with JavaScript, it's um, you go amplify in it, then amplify add API. It'll take you through a wizard that asks you if you want to do GraphQL or uh, a REST API, and then some options through that. And then you can probably get it up and running in, I think, under five minutes. Um, actually recently did a, well, recently-ish, did a webinar on that as well and uh, some talks. So go look at AWS uh, Amplify. It'll make your life simple because especially if you're just getting into the cloud and you want to learn all these different components. So it creates an API gateway, connects that with uh, AppSync, which is a managed GraphQL service, or it can create um, some REST APIs with Lambda for you, depending on which route you go. Um, the other route to go is to look at the uh, at SAM, which is the serverless application model. Uh, to build a specifically serverless application. Cool. Yeah, I see Dennis's comment actually went through also. Yeah. Yeah. With Amplify, it's similar to what we talked about regarding um, um, Elastic Beanstalk. Um, Amplify is really great to get up, up to speed uh, really quickly. And you can also have a look at the resources it creates and see how things work to then maybe later when you want to uh, want to um, basically extend your platform when you want to build more new things um, that Amplify maybe does not deliver out of the box, uh, you already have an understanding of how things work and go from there. Hmm. Uh, just quickly for the person asking the question, uh, uh, Taiti or Taiti, um, can you ping me on, um, well, actually, I'll just put it on a list here and, and send it out on Twitter. The reason is that I can't remember if it was a webinar or a local conference talk or uh, internal demo. I know that I did record it, so uh, that's the good news. I just don't currently offhand know where. Um, unfortunately, I did something like, I think, 30 different sessions in the last month, so I'm a little bit confused at the moment. Cool. Um, yeah, so just while we wait for our next question, in case you're wondering what's going on here is this is Gizmo. Um, and this is one of the benefits of working from home. You get to have your pets around you, and she just decided that it's time to sit on the lap a little bit. So she wants attention, and she's probably asking you for some food because she's always hungry. Yeah, we can't really see her. She's below the... You need to raise her, like, proper Lion King moment. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Hello. Now we want to uh, play, see? That's not a problem because also it's raining at the moment, um, and she's starting to think that it's 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in time for a walk. Because as we all know, dogs have no idea of time, and every time is walk time. 
yeah. <laughs> either that or food time or play time yeah uh, this the, this one literally you just does not stop eating we have to actually take the bowl away yeah yeah so <laughs> it only gets a bowl every now and then uh, i used to have a dog that essentially was a stomach on four feet oh yeah yeah it could have uh, it was a labrador a uh, laboratory oh. he was eating all the time uh, or he would have been if i would uh, would have let him loves our foodies that's true yeah, no, the only time she stops eating is in the so, so from lunchtime onwards. If we put out the bowl with normal dog pellets, she leave it alone, hoping to get some house food, and then only go eat at something like nine or ten at night. Because like, okay, fine, you won't give me proper food. Yeah, fine, I'll eat that. Yeah, now that I've got no other options. Yeah. <laughs> um, but continuing on with the question there at the bottom, the so Amplify is also one of those um, services that I spent a bit more time with um, in the last like three or four months than I did before. And also like super, super impressed because um, it really, once again, like Dennis mentions, it is very opinionated, but you can go and alter it if you want to. But just to get started quickly, it's super, super fast. Uh, and the big change that I've seen there is the mindset around defining uh, tasks in terms of what you want to accomplish. And so instead of saying, for example, oh, go use S3, it's framed in a way like, I want to upload a file and store it. And then there's a section on that, which is, oh, you happen to use S3 for it in the background. Or if you want to do this other thing, use these two, three services together. For example, an API, use API gateway connected to a app sync for your open GraphQL and then DynamoDB at the back. All of that is abstracted away from you. So you just define, I've got a model and this is how I want to expose it. Uh, and it makes it super easy to actually then build using um, uh, Amplify and actually get going quickly. But like I said, then you can, if you want to, go dig into the individual services and see what's happening in the background and also change them should you need to. So yeah, so I don't see any more questions at the moment. Let's just uh, quickly scan Twitter again. Um, hey Jared, I just see you're following me on Twitter. Thanks for that. <laughs> cool, yeah, awesome. Yeah, no, 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 no. My beard is not a snack. <laughs> this is the one part. We are now obviously going to, I'm going to put it down because she's going to continue asking me for food now. Because <laughs> she thinks it's time. She probably smells some toast from the kitchen or something. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, best AWS cert for DevOps. Um, for that one, it's between the sysadmin and the solution architect. Um, I believe the certified DevOps professional comes from both the old developer and the sysadmin um, base level certs. Um, I must actually just quickly check. Yeah, I was yeah, going I to have... say, I would say instead of the solution architect, I would go for um, the CSOP and the DEP, mm -hmm. that actually the professional is shared. These both are associate mm -hmm. level, it's the first, the entry, and it are two different, and then both uh, go to the professional, um, which I don't remember. What is the name of the, not the solution architect professional, the other one? Uh, that's it. That's, 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 DevOps one. Dev so it is yes. admin developer DevOps. Yeah, but uh, so. but I, I I would like to disagree. <laughs> um, yes, so it's uh, technically it's correct. The developer and the sysadmin uh, associate certifications go basically into the DevOps engineer professional. However, having done all of them, <laughs> um, I have realized that it would have been best for me because I started with developer. Um, it would have been best for me to really do the solutions architect associate. Uh, first, because you will learn about all this, uh, about many of the services on AWS and much more about the concepts, how they play together, because the developer yeah. is really specific about how to write Lambda functions, how to build, uh, how to build a, a DynamoDB table and things like that. But there are so many more things to build something on AWS. And if you have the uh, solutions architect certificate down, it's pretty simple to uh, do uh, the developer-focused things, to prepare for the developer certification and the sysops admin certification. There still is additional things that you need to learn, but that's the great thing. There are so many things you, that you can learn. So I really would start with the solutions architect associate and then see if you go um, do the other two associates from there or just go directly go uh, to the professional route. Oh, let me quickly see if I can pop that up for us. Uh, share screen. And, uh, uh, yeah, while well, you're looking one more thing, uh, in the past, previously, um, the uh, associate level certifications were required to be able to do the professional 
Um, I'm not entirely sure if this is still current. Mm -hmm. If you can yeah, just make are not. That's true. But I would recommend, yeah, like, especially if, if it's your first certification, I would recommend starting with an associate. The professional certifications are not easy. Yes, that's hmm. true. That's totally true. But uh, you could uh, do the solutions architect associate and then go for a DevOps engineer professional. True. Right. Hmm. Yeah. If you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, there's this um, fun internal story. Um, there's a, I just have to remember the guy's name now. But in is one of those persons who is in solution architecture space and literally knows pretty much every single service because he's also been here for years at AWS and knows everything. Mm -hmm. um, and they were joking because he didn't have any certifications. And I think it was at reInvent or something. Some of his teammates were like, when he's chatting with people, they would just like poke and say, hey, but don't you want to rather speak to someone who's actually certified and knows what they're talking about? So he, he did then decided, okay, fine, screw this. Let me go take the exams because you can do them at reInvent. And he actually did, I think, something like six exams back to back and passed all of them at reInvent wow. on the go just to prove a point here, which is uh, quite amusing. Um, we've got another question here about EKS. And I know where this question is coming from. It's one of those uh, fun ones we keep getting um, that, yes, like all the other services, um, we roll them out gradually for new regions. So there is, um, they are working on deploying it. We don't share any specific timelines. And uh, it'll be available at some point. Um, but yeah. And that is as much as I can tell you about that at the moment. A good example is go look at some of the other regions that recently launched, like uh, Bahrain is a good one. Get a feel for how, how much lag was there from launch till um, a specific service landed, with the caveat that that's not a guarantee that that's our timeline. Uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, local customer request um, in terms of prioritizing which services roll out. So best um, um, advice here is go speak to your account manager and ask them to log um, and add to the list of, hey, we need this service for specific use cases and also justify why you want to use it. And yeah, follow the ones new. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a really important point as, as, as Kobus uh, pointed out uh, uh, before. Um, it takes some time to roll out services, especially into new regions, because we really need to, need to make sure that everything works uh, properly. Um, but at the same time, 90 to 95 percent of our features are driven by what our customers need. And um, if if our customers say we need EKS in Africa, well, we are going to listen. Mm -hmm. It still yeah. will take some time for us to do the the, the actual work. <laughs> we can't uh, do it like this, but um, we uh, we sh certainly have to prioritize what we work on. And you telling us what you need helps us do that. So. Mm -hmm. All kinds of feedback is really appreciated. Cool. Uh, now we have another fun question, which we get often, which is when are we launching the next region in area X? Um, and so we continue to reevaluating where to launch regions. Uh, we typically take into account the geographic area of the customers that we can serve with a specific region. Um, uh, look at multiple things like, for example, is there renewable energy available? Um, uh, Etc. So there's quite a lot, and we are constantly looking at reprioritizing. And we'd like to see regions in um, pretty much every country in the world at the end, and for some countries, even multiple ones. But at the moment, no, we don't have any official communication around any more regions in Africa. So, follow up question on the EKS is we can't give an ETA, but can we? Um, uh, will it be anytime soon? It's the same. We don't give those kind of vague. Uh, hints like, oh, it's coming soon. Uh, I mean, as an indication, I kept uh, joking with people that um, I'm going to share the launch date for the Africa region for you. Uh, and then the slide would say, now, now. And then now, now would have a little asterisk that just said uh, in the first half of 2020. Um, just for uh, Dennis and Isabel in South Africa, we've got a very fun thing is that uh, when we say something will happen now, we don't actually mean now. We mean between now and the next now six and months. And when we do get a little bit more specific, we'll say it'll happen like now, now, which is between now and the next few months weeks yeah so i had a i had a so, colleague richard uh that was from also cape town and he explained me that and i had to learn that <laughs> that it's not exactly what i thought it meant but yeah i was going i was trying to put the link uh actually our container service team has a public roadmap in i don't know if it's still non-experimental but they do have the roadmap publicly on github um, so maybe, Kobus, if you can put the link, I think that will also give more insights and allow you to also put your feedback directly. That's managed by the service team. So you will mm. be directly asking them whatever features 
um, you want. Yeah, we've actually seen some more teams adopt that model where they try and use uh, a public roadmap to show what, what's on the roadmap, what's being considered and what is currently yeah. being worked on. I believe CloudFormation joined that um, recently as well. Uh, so you can definitely go there to actually have a look at what's coming. Um, we've got a next question from Thunderstorm, uh, which is any tips for building multi-stage CI/CD uh, Java apps, code hosted on Bitbucket, manual approval transition between staging stage and production would be great. And the answer there is yes. Uh, <laughs> have a look at AWS code pipeline, and then it'll, as a, as a build step, use AWS uh, code build. Um, and you can actually uh, connect it. Uh, Phil said you can connect it directly with Bitbucket. If not, you might have to have one step that just does a checkout to S3 and then from S3 kicks off the build process. Um, and then in your build pipeline, you've got the ability to uh, define all the different stages. You can have a uh, fan out for each of the stages running with things in parallel if you want. You could put in manual approval stages as well. And then it'll record who the person was that approves it. You can limit who is allowed to approve uh, you can even do cross-account AWS deployments, cross-region deployments. There's a whole lot of functionality that you can get there. Um, it does. So it definitely. Like one of those supported, so. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So it's a uh, code pipeline. Let me actually put it on the list here. I can see if I can squeeze in a quick video because what I've started doing is doing these five to 10 minutes YouTube videos on questions All that right. I get. Uh, yeah, code build plus. Uh, approved. So what I recommend is have a um, follow us on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. And what I'll do is I can't promise it this week uh, and next week is also fairly full already, but I'll look at the week after if I can do a quick video just to show how to easily uh, connect it all up. Cool. Uh, any more questions? Let's have a look here. We've had some more people join us. Um, so just quickly to recap, what we are doing is we're hosting these office hours, technical sessions every two weeks at the same, same time slot. Uh, if we see enough interest, we might take it up to every week. And what I'm currently doing is I'm roping in different people from my team to make my life easier uh, yeah. because I can then ask them to answer questions and get them to answer the questions for us. Uh, and I can sit back and drink some tea or coffee. And uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but the point here is also taking questions. We are here. Um, you can just pop them in the chat. We'll pop them on the screen then. And then we can actually discuss what you want us um, to answer. Um, so there's one more still on the topic of EKS. Did COVID delay the launch of EKS? Um, I'd go with a general, um, obviously COVID have, has, has had an impact on um, timelines of things, um, but not specifically, no. Yeah, and don't worry about the typos. Um, <laughs> I was easily able to at least understand it. Cool. Um, so CFM? Someone said still getting intermittent login issues. Um, uh, I believe that's a, a question from before using Safari and trying to get to the console. And I have spent some time on this. I believe it's something to do with the HS, what's it called, HSTS, HS, you know, in the browser where you actually provide a list of um, sites to the browser so they know to automatically redirect you to HTTPS instead of HTTP. Um, that's the, the only a thing I found so far that indicates with it, but I'm still aware of it. I'm still trying to look at it and work with the service teams uh, to figure out what is happening over there. I haven't got a definitive answer for you yet, unfortunately, but it does seem to be limited to Safari, not to uh, any of the other browsers. So just quickly, uh, Isabel and Dennis, what happens is if you go directly to the console link inside Safari, it sometimes just says cannot resolve URL, um, which is a very okay. weird one. Um, but if you do change it to HTTPS, it seems to go through, um, s s most of the time it goes through on the first time, but once again, not guaranteed every time. Um, mm -hmm. And it definitely seems it's limited to Safari for some reason. And, I, and my suspicion at the moment, it's linked to that uh, predefined list of HTTPS. Uh, oh, so it's, oh, it's um, oh. all browsers now. Okay. If it's all browsers, then I might want to say when you start looking at DNS and how your DNS resolves, because I've only seen this on Safari. I've not had it on any of the other browsers. Yeah, I've just tried it on, on, on Safari explicitly saying HTTP colon slash slash uh, console.aws.amazon.com and it redirected me to the login page. Mm. Like I said, what makes this one very difficult is that it's not always. It's very intermittent, uh, mm -hmm. but it's enough to be a problem. Um, and that's why the person's reached us out to us trying to figure it out. And I, like I said, I'm still digging into to see if I can find, but so far there's nothing conclusive yet. But um, what we can possibly do is, um, are you on the ZA Tech Slack? 
um, because you can ping me over there and we can try and do a little bit of troubleshooting um, at some point and see if maybe when you see it happening, you can, we, um, I can help you with some uh, network debugging and we can see if we can find the problem in real time. Just for those if you're not aware, we have got a local Slack group called uh, ZA Tech. It's a nonprofit um, registered organization, and um, a lot of our developers locally hang out there. Something like I think six thousand or seven thousand members. Um, mm -hmm. I'll post the link quickly for those that want to join. Unfortunately, the registration link is not hosted on HTTPS. Um, I might join that. Mm, yeah, it's it's fun. It's um, there's a lot of interest channels, and it's a fairly active Slack, uh, which is great, and it's. It's not limited to just um, software developers as technology. So you've got a lot of people that are interested in tech, um, might be slightly involved with software, not at all, also hanging out there. So it's a, it's quite a fun environment. And it's been running for a few years now as well. That's so cool. Cool. Yeah, um, OK, awesome. I will like to see you there. We have got the AWS channel. We've got a DevOps channel. Uh, there's a developer channel. There's a database channel. There's an algorithm channel. There is a puns channel, which is a lot of fun. Um, favorite new dad joke is, uh, what did Yona say when he uh, saw himself in 4K for the first time? Ooh. HDMI. OK. Um, Very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, so I love it. Um, OK, so back to the tech, tech topics. Um, let me just quickly check. I don't see any questions here. I just want to quickly scan. Uh, no questions on LinkedIn or on Twitter. It's interesting. People uh, previously commented on LinkedIn with questions, but I haven't had that since the very first time. Um, so uh, what else is fun that uh, the two of you have been working on for the last, let's say, month or so, other than the summit? Um, I know Dennis had a session yesterday. I'm curious about it. How did it oh, go? Yes. What was it about? Uh, unfortunately, we had some technical issues with the streaming. But apart from that, I, yesterday uh, there was um, the cloud security, uh, cloud security meetup in London, which is online right now, of course. So it's globally uh, <laughs> um, uh, available. Um, uh, I could do it from home. So what, what I did there yesterday was I uh, talked about how to use serverless services in AWS to do security automation, basically to remediate security incidents or deviations from the configuration that you want to have. So if somebody by mistake, for instance, turns some logging off or even maybe maliciously turns logging off to hide their, hide their tracks, um, how you can use AWS, uh, how, how you can use AWS services like Lambda, Event Bridge, and so forth to really simply plug things together to just make sure that when somebody's turning something off, that it's being turned back on, and at the same time, how to um, remove the permissions of the the actors or the user or the role that has yeah. been doing that. I mean, as I said, it could be a misconfiguration. Maybe somebody clicked the wrong button or or uh, or accidentally used the wrong API call. Um, and if we are too permissive in terms of uh, we give uh, the users on AWS, um, uh, give the user accounts uh, open permissions, like everybody has admin access, uh, which they shouldn't have because uh, we should apply the principle of least privilege. But sometimes, of course, that's a lot of work. Um, and uh, also, I sometimes tend to give myself admin permissions if I want to do something, and then I do something, and then after the fact, I realize, oh, that is not what I intended to do. And it's really helpful, especially in a production account, to have a certain amount of controls in place that listen for specific things that should never happen, mm. and if they happen anyway, um, that they are being reverted. And maybe the person that did it gets locked out, at least for now, uh, and a message is being sent to, uh, an email is being sent to maybe a security uh, team or to myself, if it's my own account, just so that I know this happened. And I might want to mm -hmm. talk to the person who did that. Maybe they did that on purpose, uh, but maybe it was just an accident. Um, long story short, I showed in a quick demo of about 15 to 20 minutes uh, end to end how you can really build a function that does all this in a specific mm -hmm. scenario. And I think it is hosted on Twitch. So if anybody wants to look at it, 
Um, it was streamed on Twitch. Uh, the session is hosted on Twitch at uh, CloudSec TV. Um, there were two sessions. I was the second. So if you're interested, just go and have a look. Um, I'll, I'll mm. host that. Uh, the name of the channel is CloudSec TV. Which I can't post the link because that will. So we that layout. Redacted. So whenever I um oh wait let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger um here this kind of thing it reminds me of uh this little device it's called the the useless box yeah um basically what it is is a an actuator with a little arm as soon as you flip the switch it switches it off again that's it it doesn't do anything else mm -hmm. um and this always makes me think about these uh, especially environments where you like as soon as someone tries to toggle something incorrectly it just goes like nope change it back and you can continue clicking with it and it'll be like click 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 the whole time um, and it's super, use, super, super useful. Yeah. Um, and especially with all the cloud automation with infrastructure as code, you can get very far with this. Um, exactly. You can automate everything. You can really automate everything. And you might argue that, uh, well, why don't you give the person, uh, why don't you hand out permissions to do that in the first place? You can, could just deny that. But at the same hmm. time, um, you might have a misconfiguration in your uh, permissions management. That happens as well. You might have a misconfiguration. And that's why security. And governance is always a multi-layered approach. You have your protection in terms of policies and and uh, permissions in IAM, but at the same time, you also have monitoring of the resources. So in case somebody uh, some, somehow the per permissions were misconfigured or somebody elevated their privileges maliciously, and they then do that thing, I still don't want it to happen. So I have multiple mm. layers of protection in place where I say uh, nobody's allowed to do that. But if anybody does it anyway, or even tries it, make sure it is being reverted and it's being reported, um, things like that. Mm. So that's, um, um, I mean, you can do that indefinitely. At some point, you have to have to find a balance between um, creating layers upon layers. But at the same time, it's pretty simple inside of AWS really to to make this uh, to to have this multi layer uh, layered approach. Mm. There's another question. Okay. There. Yes, this is a very good question. So I'm going to pop it on the screen quickly. Uh, so can you explain the concept of delegated administrators, e.g. calls to the organization API that need to be formed from uh, a master account or, um, or a member account, which is a delegated admin? Um, this is a very fun feature with um, uh, IAM, which is Identity and Access Management, where you can set up a set of permissions, uh, so a bunch of policies and attach them to specific roles. So let's say we call it the uh, admin role inside the developer account. Um, which is sitting on here, completely isolated environment and account on an AWS level over here. Then on this side, you've got another IAM user and you can grant that user permission to assume this role. So what happens is when they assume that role, any API call that's made is made as if it's being made inside that other AWS account with a specific IAM policy attached to it. Um, and that's how you can actually delegate the permission between different accounts and you can have different sets of permissions as well and allow people to then effectively hop between these different accounts with a single login. So for example, when um, I make an API call, the first call is then to say, um, switch into this other role, or I can configure the CLI to actually have this predefined saying, uh, when I use this specific AWS profile, make use of this role inside that other account that I, and then it'll handle the switching for you if you are allowed when you use the double dash profile inside the API commands. Yeah, maybe to get, go one step further, um, that is that is in general how how cross account uh, permissions uh, permission management works on AWS. Specifically regarding the AWS organization, you have the payer account, uh, also known as the master account, uh, where you have where you basically manage all the member accounts, and the master account needs really needs to be well protected because if somebody breaks into that, if somebody gets gets access to that, it can wreak havoc across your whole organization, which is why we have a number of additional um, um, safety guards in place so that you cannot just go into the mass from a member account, cannot just um, go into the master account and change things. Um, but we put this a concept of the delegated administrator in front of it so that you can then um, go through, through a safeguarded channel that we basically provide to do things uh, in the organization from a mem member account without having to log into the master account, which, because that's inherently dangerous. Cool. So have a look here. Uh, yeah, skeptical from Penguin. Just reply to the tweet. Uh, people seem to be enjoying my background. 
<laughs> well, actually, there's a there's another fun one over here. It's just off screen. My second favorite one, which is uh, we're doomed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, the 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 cross account. Sorry, I just realized I don't have my headset mic on. Uh, we can easy. still hear you. Uh, yeah. What <laughs> uh, that? <laughs> That, that I must uh, attribute to the, uh, well, both firstly this mic I've got, which is a Blue Yeti um, <laughs> over here, and I've configured it to use the NVIDIA RTX machine learning noise cancelling. And it's actually very, very good at figuring out what it is that it's supposed to be picking up in the room. Um, previous session, um, actually, no, it's not on at the moment because I, I was worried my neighbor's got a recurring um, gardening service at this point because I've had it twice now at this slot where the lawnmowers are literally about three meters from my window over here. Um, and it doesn't come through on the stream because it's able to actually filter that out. Um, so I'm very, very impressed with it. I remember that demo that you did to mm. me. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. Yeah, no, it's like, I'm literally sitting here, I can't hear myself speak. And then everyone else is saying like, no, 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 it's fine. We can hear you. I'm like, It was okay. so noisy, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me see if we've got some more questions. Uh, we've got about five minutes left on this session today. Uh, so please, if you want to squeeze in one more question, um, um, hit us up on the chat. Um, I'm seeing mostly questions coming in from Twitch, which makes sense because we didn't advertise this on uh, YouTube. Uh, but we are actually streaming this to another channel called the Cloud Builders. Uh, so our team is busy setting that up. We're busy working on getting some videos ready, and we want to start regularly releasing videos there uh, on YouTube as well. So. Uh, keep an eye on our uh, Twitter feeds. You can see our handles in the little ticker at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we will be launching that channel soon, like now, now. <laughs> yeah, cool. Question. Uh, 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 let's see the first one, which is question for the Cape Town data center. Uh, okay, so the first part that we have to clarify first is that it's not the Cape Town data center singular. Um, it is actually three of them because we launched with three availability zones and one availability zone consists of at least one data center. And then as we go, we add on additional data centers to the availability zone. Um, for context, our largest AZ has got 14 data centers um, attached to it. Uh, quick, more any large service deployments, uh, maybe of note, uh, obviously, yes, we are deploying, uh, we are constantly deploying new services there. We are busy. Um, they're constantly rolling out. So, and it's not a public roadmap, unfortunately, when what rolls out, but we do have uh, a lot of services in the pipeline that are busy rolling out. Best recommendation there is keep a, uh, an eye on that RSS feed we have of all the services as they roll out. Um, I think we just, if you give me a second, I remember seeing two nice ones for Cape Town quite recently. Um, where is my public feed now? Sorry. I think maybe if the other two have got a, um, something to add to that, I will find this quickly. There we go. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's busy loading. What's new at AWS? Um, yeah. Let me see. Here we go. What has launched recently? Uh, I, was it AppSync? So it's one of those like literally, so just putting it in context for those who are joining us um, after the discussion earlier, we internally as well also have got this public feed and that's our source of truth in terms of knowing when what launched. Um, and we also scan that from time to time to keep an eye on it. And as with everything else, it's uh, remembering all of it is the problem. Um, I'm trying to see. I actually have seen some people that are able to filter by region. They have got some custom plugins. Unfortunately, I don't have that yet. Um, there's uh, been on the chat. There's been the question to maybe reintroduce ourselves for the uh, folks who have joined. Okay. Mm. Um, maybe we wanna just do that. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, we shall. Uh, I can see that uh, Isabel is quite keen to do it first again. So you can go first again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was waiting for this opportunity. <laughs> So my name is Isabel, uh, Isabel Huerga, actually. And I joined the developer advocacy team at AWS a couple, two or three months ago, more or less. Uh, before that, I was I was still in AWS, uh, but as a technical account manager, uh, so a TAM, which is part of the support team. Uh, and I, yeah, I was a TAM for about three years or so. Um, and I'm 
currently in the UK team, based in UK, but yeah, uh, I know people usually ask, my accent is not British at all. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take it out of the way. Uh, I'm actually Spanish, uh, but I have been living 10 years in Italy. That's why it's so weird and confusing probably. <laughs> and that's it. Cool, yeah, Dennis? Yeah, I'll go on. My name is Dennis, Dennis Taub. I'm based out of Germany. Um, the north of Germany, so very far away from, from South Africa. Um, but we're in the same, uh, same time zone. So I'm, uh, I'm a developer advocate, just uh, like uh, my two colleagues here. Um, I've been with the developer advocacy team for actually two and a half weeks now. Uh, I used to be a solutions architect with AWS before that, uh, supporting customers. Um, and I've always been a developer by heart. And uh, that's why I joined this team in, uh, yeah. That's it. I think. <laughs> awesome. So uh, my name is Chris Bernard, and I've actually been on the team now for a year and a half, uh, or seven dog years, as we count them. Um, and uh, based in Cape Town, uh, so I'm the local person here on the show. And yeah, I was a AWS, or well, working on AWS built systems for about eight years before I joined. So I've been uh, doing this for a while. Um, and I see we have got some more questions over here. Let's quickly see. Uh, First one is, is there going to be an AWS SDK for Flutter? I'm assuming here to integrate with the um, Flutter is a mobile application, native application framework, I believe. Um, and I actually don't know if there's any specific plans at this point to integrate it directly. Uh, Flutter itself, I believe, is built on Kotlin. Um, I've only touched this. It's been a while since I've done any detailed mobile development. Um, so maybe if you can, um, okay, so it's Dart based. Okay, cool. So Dart is the base language then. And well, no, we don't have a Dart uh, or AWS SDK for Dart at the moment. So gut feel here would say we would have to see that first and it depends on the adoption of Dart as a mainstream language and how much demand we have. And as with anything you want us to build, please connect with your account manager and ask for this because the more people that ask, the more um, the higher it goes up in the priority list because we always have people asking us to build things. Uh, Cool, there is one more uh, over here. We are going a little bit over time, but I think it's fine. Uh, which is, event, is EventBridge designed to function as a core application service or as a DevOps service? Maybe, um, maybe I can take that one because, maybe I can take that one because that's what I talked about last night as well. Um, okay, perfect. The question to the answer, yes. Um, it is designed to function as a core application service and it is also designed to function as a DevOps service. Um, it, it totally depends on how you want to use it. Many, um, uh, a part of it used to be uh, uh, the CloudWatch events, um, which has been built out into its own service. So um, basically an event bus that AWS used internally where uh, CloudTrail, for instance, every API call. So whenever you started an instance or deployed a re resource, um, every API call in AWS went uh, through CloudTrail our auditing and logging service and uh, basically put an event, a cloud trail event on on an internal bus. And this bus has, has been externalized as its own service now. So you have this default bus for all the cloud internal communication, but you can also uh, create your own buses for your applications or for third party applications. And there are many SaaS providers like Salesforce, for instance, who are actually able and using um, event bridge buses for application to application communication. So um, many, many developers actually are using it for applications, but um, there is also an increasing um, amount of uh, people who are using it for uh, operations. So it can be really used for both and it is designed to be used for both. Mm. Thanks, Dennis. It's also one of the services I've uh, played with a bit more recently. Um, it's really super, super easy to use. A couple of clicks. Um, my use case was, how do I react to a CVE that's raised when I've scanned a Docker image that I just built and pushed to ECR? And it ended up being, on in ECR, it's a, a checkbox like when you create the repo, enable scanning. And then you go to event bridge, say source is AWS, and then ECR is a service, and then image scan. And then you say, where do you want to send it, which is Lambda in my case. So I think it takes like, under a minute to hook that up. And then you set up your Lambda and decide what you want to do with it. So in terms of application building, if you want to connect lots of different services together, it's awesome. And especially that third party service portion where it's something hosted outside of AWS. 
because uh, like Dennis mentioned, there's a whole list of providers that have already built integrations into EventBridge, um, Salesforce, Datadog, um, Neuralink, a whole bunch of them. And then you can connect it up and then react to things raised on their end in your application, because that's always been a, a development friction point where it's like you have to build your own webhook, connect it with their one, handle the authentication and how you get notified, et cetera. And now it's as easy as going there, a couple of clicks, you connect it, and it's bi-directional, so you can set one up, for example, as well, to a workflow to push things from inside your account out as well. Um, so super, super useful. Mm -hmm. um, quickly, we've got this question on Snowball, and what I wanted to answer that one is that, once again, sorry, uh, this view, sorry, there we go, is that um, I'll paste the link here in the chat again. If you want to know what services are currently rolled out in any specific region, uh, you can use, um, uh, this link to actually check if it's available. And what you can see over there is that Snowball hasn't rolled out in um, South Africa yet. Um, we can see that it's available in Paris and Stockholm, um, not yet in Bahrain uh, or Milan or Cape Town, which are the most recent re regions in this list. Um, so no, not yet. Um, that was the fun one. I do believe they announced that uh, AWS Outposts is rolling out in South Africa, which is quite a lot of fun. Um, that was the one announcement that I was thinking about just now. Um, quickly, for those unfamiliar, um, Outpost is where we bring a, a rack of AWS hardware and put it inside your data center or on-prem um, center, and then you can connect it to your closest region, which will be Cape Town, and then you can actually deploy certain of our services onto that uh, rack, like EC2, RDS, um, even ECS uh, is showing that list now. So this is, the use case here is if you need your um, processing to be that much closer to wherever it is that uh, you're hosting, you want to host the service. So the request is, uh, for example, if the latency to, let's say, in Joburg and the 20 or 25 second latency is too high, like let's say manufacturing um, and so other, um, other on-prem solutions, you can actually bring the hardware closer to you and then run the applications on there, connect them um, with the various services as well. So that's the use case we've seen for Outposts. Uh, quickly scanning. Um, Boom, boom. Uh, we did reintroduce ourselves. We covered the event bridge. Um, yeah, I think I see it. We are actually six minutes past now. So this was a lot of fun. Thank you to uh, Isabel and Dennis for joining me this week. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I'm going to try and convince um, other teammates, uh, different ones, to join me with these sessions um, primarily to make my life easier, but also I think it gives a lot of value because we, we've got different speciality areas and different uh, experiences with AWS to actually help give people um, um, and that. Uh, just quickly, Anwar Peck asked us any partners that, that have opted for Outposts at the moment. I don't have that info at hand, and I do believe unless it's a, a partner that publicly states that they did that, we don't generally disclose that kind of information about what services which um, customer use unless we've had the conversation and they are happy for us to share that. Uh, but definitely reach out to your account manager because they will have that list available and know which ones have done that before. So. With that, thank you very, very much for joining us in today's stream. And thank you very much, uh, Isabel and Dennis, for joining us. This was a lot of fun. A pleasure. And we will, we will do more of these in future. And you can bring your dogs to the session as well, if you have any. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, thank you. Me. Thanks. Bye. Cool. OK. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>